So, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining. Welcome to this event, which uh, is focusing on the launching of the report, Ending Conflicts Over Water Solutions to Water and Security Challenges. Um, my name is Susanne Schmeier. I'm the manager of the Water, Peace and Security Partnership and a senior lecturer at IAG Delft in the Netherlands. And WPS, the Water, Peace and Security Partnership, is uh, or has joined the Pacific Institute and the World Resources Institute today in launching this uh, report because the, two, the three organizations together work on turning vicious cycles of water and conflict into virtuous ones um, that focus on water, peace and stability. Before we dive into the topic, however, let me share a few housekeeping issues with you. First of all, of course, keep your microphones turned off. Um, secondly, the event is being recorded, so you'll be able to re-watch the event or share it with your colleagues afterwards, and you'll find the video after this event on the events page, so the page where you registered for, for today's event. And lastly, also there's a Q&A part in this session, so you're very welcome and invited to share your questions, your comments, your thoughts on the topic with us by using the Q&A function on Zoom, which should appear on the lower end of your screen below the slides and below the, the pictures of us. Uh, you can send your questions and your comments now already. We'll be collecting them and then get back to them later towards the end of the session. So much for the, for the housekeeping. Let's really start looking at the topic. Um, I guess it's very well known to all of you that there is a water relate or a link between water and competition, conflict, instability, most often not in a direct way, so water being a direct cause of conflict, but very often in the form of a threat multiplier that acts in interdependence with other socioeconomic and political factors. However, at the same time, there's still a lot that we don't know about the linkages between water and conflict. There are still questions such as, uh, why do water-related conflicts occur in one region, but not in another, even if the framework conditions might be very similar? Or why do um, water-related droughts turn into bigger conflicts or lead to migration in areas where no one would have expected that before? And what are the feedback loops between water and conflict on the one hand and conflict affecting water or water being um, impacted by conflict on, on the other hand? But I think what is very important and what we'll be focusing on today is um, in spite of this lack of a full understanding of the water and conflict nexus, it is now time to focus on action. So there will be or there is a need for decision making under uncertainty that is required to move ahead to prevent, mitigate or resolve water related conflicts and especially um, focus on their various negative repercussions when it comes to ecosystems, to socioeconomic development and so on. So as I was saying, it's now the time to focus on solutions and to investigate which sets of solutions are available and how they can be best employed in a specific community, in a specific country, or even in a transboundary setting. Of course, uh, keeping in mind that there's no one size fits all um, solution. And in order to identify these, these solutions, these sets of solutions and the combination in which they could or should be applied, we need good data, we need good information and the report that we're launching today, Ending Conflicts Over Water Solutions to Water and Security Challenges, is doing exactly that. It aims at highlighting some of the ongoing water crisis that we see around the world, and is then offering potential solutions from various angles, from a natural resources and science angle, from a political and legal angle, from an economic and financial angle, and last but not least, also from a policy and governance angle. And we'll be looking at these challenges and the solutions, the sets of solutions and their implementation, but also the impediments that they face with regards to their implementation today. But before we look specifically at these solutions with our various panelists, we are very happy to have Kitty van der Heiden with us today to share her keynote speech with us. Kitty van der Heiden is the Director General International Cooperation at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, has been involved for a long time in water-related um, discussions on conflict and is supporting the work that Pacific Institute, WRI and WPS are doing on that topic. So very pleased to welcome you, Kitty. The floor is yours. Thank you, Susanna, and 
Thanks to all for, first of all, organizing uh, this seminar. I think this is incredibly important. As you've mentioned, uh, I've been working on these issues for quite a while. And you're right, you said, there are so many things we still don't know. But at the same time, we can't rule anything out. And so many times in my job, I have to ask the question, what if? And so what if we continue our current path and further deplete and pollute our freshwater resources? What if tensions, let's say, around the Nile keep increasing and if these countries actually take up their weapons? What if these tensions spill over to a wider region? What will happen to the people that depend on those resources? The women and the children? What will happen to the animals or the wetlands that need these waters? What about the hard fought progress that we've seen over past decades in the socioeconomic domain in these regions? Because if there is no water, people will start to move. If there is no water, politicians are gonna try and get their hands on it and they might start to fight over it. And it's threats like these that keep me up at night uh, and made me realize that we have to act. And one reason why I took up this job is that I'm trying to integrate in the development work that we do, both the human development side, the social economic progress, environmental stability, but take that into a geopolitical and security context that is actually uh, deteriorating pretty fast. Why today's focus on water? Because it's simply our most indispensable natural resource. We need it for almost anything, for our health, to grow our cities, to develop our economies, to produce food, to produce energy, to keep our ecosystems healthy. There simply is no alternative. And we know that supply might be stable, but demand is increasing. And so at some point, we're gonna hit the wall and that wall might be different in different places. You would assume that we would treat this fairly precious resource with great care, uh, make sure that everyone has access everywhere uh, to safe and sufficient quantities of drinking water, for example, or to produce your goods now and in the future. And we see by analysis that the opposite is true, that actually water scarcity is becoming a growing problem. And I'm sure you've all heard of Thomas Paine, an 18th century British American political activist who once said, what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. And I believe that we have taken our natural resources far too lightly for much too long. We've obtained it way too cheap and the consequences are now becoming more visible every day. There were recently published data from WRI that clearly highlight that 17 countries, home to about a quarter of humanity, face extremely high levels of water stress. That over 2 billion people live in countries experiencing high water stress. And that by 2040, one in four of the world's children, about 600 million in all, will be living in areas of extremely high water stress. How can we bring dignity and the prospect of achieving the SDGs within that context. If you look at practical examples like Chennai, only last year, it's one of the six largest cities in India, ran out of water and had to have tankers bring water to a needy population. The year before that, we'll all remember in 2018, Cape Town reaching point zero. Um, here in the Netherlands this summer, we were facing acute drought and we were all put on high alert and instructed to use less water. Now I'm lucky to live in a country and in a region where water problems will highly unlikely lead to instability or conflict. We have resilient economies, we have strong participatory governance, but there are many other countries and many other people that are not as lucky as I am. They live in regions where populations is incre are increasing very rapidly, where cities are growing, where demands are increasing, and where most people work in agriculture, one of the largest users of water. Where climate change is compounding the challenge in terms of supply and in access. Where inequality is high. Where the social contract between government and its people may not be the same as what I experience in my country. And when systems, societies and governments are not adequately equipped to deal with water stress, 
that's when things may break down. And it's in these fragile regions where water scarcity can act, as Susanna says, as a threat multiplier and become a driver of instability, if not conflict, both within and between countries. Now, I don't believe in doomsday scenario per se. And I think that's the beauty of the report that we're launching today. There are also solutions to the very complex problems that we are discussing today. And so I really recommend everybody reads the report, um, look at challenges from Yemen to India, from the Sahel to Iraq. It explores the drivers of the conflict, but it also explores, importantly, the solutions. There is obviously no silver bullet. There is no one single solution that will eliminate water insecurity. They have identified more than a dozen strategies altogether that could, if we do this cohesively and coherently, reduce water insecurity and prevent water-related instability and conflict. Let me highlight three final elements that I believe are crucial to ending the conflict over water. One, if we are to deal with the problem of water scarcity in its many domains, geopolitical, socio-economical, and in terms of human, um, human progress and development, we must first understand well what the root causes of the problems are. I think there ha is a huge amount of information available out there. We have, we're drowning in data, I would say, uh, through internet, mobile phones. We are gathering data with the speed of lightning. We just don't have the capacity to always analyze them. If we could get local communities access to those data, I think that would be incredibly helpful to find local solutions where they are needed. Um, that could also lead to next generation insights and tools and partnerships to really address those complex problems. And that's exactly what the Water, Peace and Security Partnership that Susanna was referencing uh, is doing. They have created an early warning tool, which I believe is incredibly important to forecast where water related conflicts might take place. It combines water data with social, economic and political variables. And through a process of ma machine learning, it predicts where hotspots and where instability might increase. That allows us to basically front load where humanitarian aid is needed. We can take preventive diplomatic action if needed, and we can make sure that we protect the poorest of the poor. And we've been a proud supporter of this partnership right from the beginning. Secondly, uh, just as there is no single cause of conflict, there is also no single solution for it. What is incredibly important for any solution to be successful is that it is grounded in the local context and that it requires local involvement with local stakeholders, including women, including youth and others. Only in that way we can make real progress. And um, to this end, uh, we're also looking at how we can create cross-sectoral partnerships uh, because that too will be an important part of creating lasting solutions, which is where the Planetary Security Initiative that we launched in 2015 comes in, creating a community of practice that can learn from each other, create best practices, and manage the less for more challenge of reduced water supply and increased demand. And then lastly, we must of course work together to implement this report and to overcome the barriers to implementation. We know the many solutions that are there. But to actually implement them, we still face many barriers, be they technical, financial, or in terms of political will. Had it been easy, it would already have been done. In conclusion, this is a very complex problem. There are many, many easy and complex solutions. Prevention of conflict may not, may not always be possible, but our decisions, the decisions that we take today matter for the future of mankind and for the future of the planet. We can still prevent the worst from happening. If we implement the solutions that are part of this report, we will, we will, um, sorry, I was distracted by one of the messages that came in on the screen. If we implement the solutions in this report, we can actually prevent not just human suffering, but also make sure that peace and security is serviced and that people find a life of dignity with sufficient quantities of water. Thank you so much. Back to you, Susanna. Thank you very much, Kitty. Thanks especially for reminding us of why we're doing the work and why we've all come here together to address this, this important topic. Um, thanks a lot for that. 
before we move to the solutions, let's take one step back and look at actually what we're talking about when we say water conflict. There's not the water conflict, there's water in conflict, there's water affected by conflict, there's water as a cause of conflict, and many, many more dimensions. And we're lucky to have um, Peter Glick here with us today. Peter is the co-founder and the president emeritus of the Pacific Institute. And he'll provide us with an overview of the latest trends in the water conflict nexus and we'll highlight these different dimensions that I've just been referring to. Peter, please. Thank you very much, Suzanne, uh, and the Water Peace and Security Partnership. Uh, and thank you, Kitty, for your comments uh, to introduce this project. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, the background, the history of, of what we're discussing here. Uh, next slide, please. As Kitty and Suzanne have, have mentioned as well, we are introducing this new report. This is a screenshot of the cover you've seen in your chat box, uh, a link to where the full report can be found. Uh, but I'd also like to thank my co-authors, Charlie Iceland and Ayushi Trevetti for their work on this uh, project. It's been a long and important project. Next slide. A little bit of history, next. First of all, uh, the, the discussion about environmental security is a long one. Uh, there's been a great deal of conversation, discussion. Uh, Kitty, perhaps if you could mute your microphone. Thank you. Uh, definitions of security have varied and expanded over time from traditional forms of national security to a longer, more recent discussion about environmental security issues. Next. There is a long history of conflicts over fresh water in particular. There's a history of conflicts over other resources as well, uh, but water has been especially an especially important flashpoint. Next. The conflicts over water take many forms, and I'll come back and talk a little more about this. We see conflicts as, of water as a trigger, water as a weapon, and water as a casualty of conflict. Next. I would also like to argue that the risks of water-related disputes are growing, that conflicts over water are increasing in time, and I'll show some data related to that, in part because of growing scarcity over water, but in part because of a whole range of other economic, social, political, and environmental factors as well. Next. These water-related factors, water challenges associated with uh, all sorts of problems associated with water will have both direct and indirect impacts on security and conflict and addressing water broadly can help address these issues moving forward. Next slide. In our work in this, we think about water conflict in three forms. We think about water as a trigger of conflict where water is a trigger or root cause of conflict. And we see this with pastoralists and farmers in Africa. We see it with disputes over scarcity and control of water in regions. And in this report, we looked at India and Iran as case studies. The second category is water as a weapon of conflict, conflicts that may start for other reasons entirely, for reasons of economic competition or political or religious or ideological factors. And we, we've seen this especially recently in the Middle East where water has been diverted from villages uh, during the conflicts in Iraq and Syria, uh, where dams were taken over and floodgates were opened in Iraq in 2017. We've seen it where water wells have been poisoned in Somalia, where water or water systems have been a weapon in conflicts. And the third category is where water or water systems are targets or casualties of conflict. Again, conflicts that may start for other reasons, but where water systems are considered targets. Again, we've seen this all for a long time in, in history. We saw this in World War II. We saw it in Vietnam when the United States attacked the irrigation systems, and more recently in Iraq and Syria and Yemen, where civilian water systems have been targeted during those conflicts. Next slide. As part of this, Kitty mentioned we have a lot of data in many cases. One of the things that we've been doing at the Pacific Institute, where I work uh, for many, many years is maintaining an open source database on water conflicts throughout history. Uh, the data go back more than 4,500 years. Uh, the website, as you can see at the top here, is worldwater.org, or you can Google water conflict chronology. And that data is available to anyone who wants it. Next slide. 
We present those data in a chronological list. We present it in map form. Uh, we present it in a chronology. Uh, this is a screenshot of the map. Each of these dots is an entry in the database. And if you click on each entry, you can get information about the time, the place, the parties involved, the kind of conflict. Uh, there uh, are links to more detailed citations for each of these references. And this chronology now has over 900 entries through history of each of those different forms of conflict, water as a trigger, water as a casualty, water as a, as a target, uh, or a weapon in conflict. Next slide. Uh, here's a graph that shows just from 1980 up until through 2018 of the number and the type of conflicts in the database. And you can see a couple of different things. First, unfortunately, again, as Kitty and Suzanne mentioned, uh, we see an increase in the conflicts over time, a very significant increase in the last several decades as water has become a more precious resource. But we also see broken out by the type of conflict, weapon, casualty, and trigger, trends in the kinds of conflicts that we see. And in particular, we've seen in the last few years, a very significant increase in the number of entries, the number of conflicts where water systems have been a casualty of conflict, where water systems have been explicitly targeted because of their value. And I would note that's actually a violation of the Geneva Conventions, but uh, when we talk about solutions, we'll talk about that aspect in particular. Next slide. Again, as Kitty mentioned, uh, one of the things that the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership has developed over, over the last year or so is this global early warning tool. Uh, this is, again, a screenshot from that, and the website is listed at the top uh, of the 2020 forecast that takes the data from the water conflict chronology, takes information about population dynamics and economics and agricultural production and a whole range of other factors, and tries to develop insight into where these kinds of conflicts are likely to occur over the next six to nine to 12 months. Uh, this is a tool that we hope will be increasingly useful in identifying where conflicts may occur and where we may, may want to focus our efforts on reducing the risks of conflicts. And I think uh, our, my colleagues will talk a little bit more about this in the, in the next talks. Next slide. Finally, the point here is if we have a better understanding of how conflicts occur, maybe we can have a better understanding of how to reduce the risks of conflicts over water. Next. And we looked at, in this case, four strategies. We looked at technical and engineering strategies to address water scarcity or to improve access to water or to improve the efficiency of water use and reduce the risks of tensions over water scarcity. Next. We looked at economic strategies to improve allocation, to develop smart subsidies or smart investments to improve water systems. Next slide. Next. We looked at management issues, how to manage institutional failures or reduce the risk of institutional failures and improve how we manage access to water, control of water, distribution of water, equity issues around water. Next. And finally, we looked at political and legal strategies. The Geneva Convention, in theory, prohibits attacks on civilian water systems. Obviously, that by itself has not been enough. But are there other legal strategies, uh, other political strategies that help us move from conflict to cooperation? Uh, those are the focus of the report. The report includes a whole series of very important, very detailed case studies looking at both conflicts and in particular success stories for reducing the risks of conflicts over water. Uh, and I look forward to the conversation as we move forward uh, from the theory to implementation of how to reduce these conflicts. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much, Peter, for giving us an overview of where we stand with our knowledge on the different types of links between water and conflict. It's time to move to the solutions, which is what we're here for today. And I'd like to invite Charlie. Charles Iceland um, is the Director of Global and National Water Initiatives at the World Resources Institute to give us um, an introduction to the solutions that the report identifies, share some key insights on these solutions, but also share some thoughts with us on what the barriers are that we're facing when implementing these solutions. Charlie. 
Thanks so much, Susanna, to, to Kitty and, and Peter. And, and thanks to everyone uh, for participating uh, in this event. We'll now discuss solutions to water and security challenges within the framework we've developed for our report and, and then end uh, by touching briefly on barriers to implementation, i.e. why we don't see these solutions implemented more widely. Our water solutions framework. Well, in the report we're launching today, as Peter mentioned, we, we organize our solutions under four broad categories natural resources, science and engineering approaches, political and legal tools, economic and financial tools, and policy and governance strategies. Uh, so let's review some of these solutions, beginning with the natural resources, science, and engineering approaches. Water efficiency and conservation improvements. <clears throat> As sources of water supply have dwindled in many places, uh, there's been an increasing focus on improving water use efficiency, thereby reducing water demand. <clears throat> the water savings can then enable new water uses, uh, including boosting environmental flows, if that is needed. Uh, these kinds of improvements are available in every sector of the economy and include investment in efficient irrigation technologies, as you see here, uh, an example of drip irrigation, <clears throat> water efficient industrial processes and methods for reducing food loss and waste, to, to name just a few. New sources of water. Natural systems such as wetlands, forests, floodplains, and soils can contribute to sustainable water supply and protect against extreme weather events. Where possible, such green infrastructure should be used with or instead of traditional physical infrastructure like dams, levees, reservoirs, treatment systems, and pipes. Uh, both because it, it can be less costly and because it, it encourages the preservation of ecosystems and the many services they provide humankind. Data collection and information systems. Uh, new in situ and remote sensing uh, monitoring tools can help farmers apply the right amount of water at the right time and in the right places. New sensors for detecting leaks can help urban utilities reduce losses of high quality water, as you can see here in the slide. Uh, accurate smart meters can help water users better understand their water use and, and improve the efficiency of their use. Um, <clears throat> open data platforms can permit countries sharing transboundary water resources to resolve disputes. Now let's take a look at an example of political and legal tools. Minimum flow requirements. Some tensions over water are related to ecological problems associated with over extraction of surface water and groundwater. In Iran, for example, the drying of numerous lakes and marshes have contributed to local protests over water policy and allocations. In India and China, many lakes and rivers are also drying up as a result of over extraction of water. Many wealthier countries mitigate these types of risks by imposing minim, minimum river flow requirements, which can halt over extraction. The international community can help poorer countries establish their own river flow requirements through technical assistance programs. Now let's take a, a look at an example of economic and financial tools. Water pricing. Water prices rarely reflect the true cost of providing it. Increasing prices to reflect the full cost of service could help pay for current operation and maintenance costs while providing reliable financing to improve and expand water infrastructure. Pricing structures should also protect access to safe and adequate water and sanitation, a basic human right, for poor and disadvantaged communities through carefully designed tariffs, subsidies, and or social safety net programs. More generally, water pricing should reflect societal values of efficiency or economic values, inclusiveness or social values, and sustainability or environmental values. Now let's take a look at, at an example of policy and governance strategies. Stakeholder and community engagement. Broad-based engagement of water users, communities, and other stakeholders in water resources management 
is required to make informed and legitimate decisions. We need such engage engagement now more than ever as climate change and growing demands on natural resources make people compete for limited water resources. <clears throat> the restoration initiative in Kenya's Tana Delta, uh, for example, provides uh, an example of successful engagement with stakeholders. Tensions between local farmers and animal herders over increasingly scarce water uh, and land reached a high point in 2012 when, over, uh, when 286 people died in clashes between these communities. By bringing communities together to participate in land use decisions, the restoration initiative has helped over 100 villages restore and better manage natural resources, reducing local tensions. Barriers to implementation. While we can usually identify solutions to water and security challenges, they're often difficult, uh, they're, they are often difficult to implement for a number of reasons, including political and economic trade-offs inherent in the proposed solutions, uh, problems associated with collective action, such as the issue of free riders who use services without paying for them, uh, scarce financial resources, lack of technical capacity, social and cultural barriers, and widespread and entrenched corruption. Uh, and there, there are other barriers that exist as well. These barriers can be overcome with sufficient political will. More research is needed to understand how best to generate this political will. In the meantime, though, we need to target key international, national, and local stakeholders and make the political case to implement necessary but difficult solutions to water and security challenges. Otherwise, we will likely see a rising number of water-related conflict, uh, water scarcity and flood-induced displacements of populations, and failed states. There are many other water security solutions and examples of how they, they have or can be implemented, and I hope you have a chance to read about them in our new report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie, um, for highlighting these solutions, but also the, the barriers that are facing. I do see a lot of questions coming in and quite a few of the questions and the comments that all of you are sharing with us relate to questions around equity. They relate to questions of distribution of water, questions around water rights and whether water rights issue aren't maybe more of an issue when it comes to water conflict than water scarcity in absolute and, and hydrological terms. And this is indeed a very, a very important issue. Social equity is something that um, cannot be ignored, that is very crucial to solving water-related challenges. So I'm very happy that we have Ayushi Trivedi with, with us here today. Ayushi is the Gender and Social Equity Research Specialist at the World Resources Institute and will hopefully address some of your questions now and will share uh, insights into the importance of considering gender and social equity components when addressing water-related challenges. Ayushi, please. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, and good morning, afternoon, and good evening to all the participants of the webinar. Um, I'll be talking about some of the solutions in our report that specifically look at gender and social equity and employing participatory mechanisms and an inclusive and rights-based perspective. Um, but before I jump right into explaining the solution side of it, I think it's important to understand why this gender and social equity lens was important in terms of water and conflict challenges. Um, next slide, please. Yes. Um, so in all societies, certain populations may be more vulnerable to risks of water insecurity, and that depends on various factors like their gender, ethnicity, income, race, uh, religion, other characteristics. Um, and for some of these groups, these vulnerabilities to water insecurity further compound their economic and social pressures that they already bear. Um, and it was also important to note that these vulnerabilities and these um, differential impacts also further affect the social, economic, and environmental outcomes and efficiency of projects and policies that are put in place to reduce water-related insecurity and conflict. Um, and this, um, these themes came up in a lot of our case studies. So for example, when we looked at the city of Basra, 
um, we, there were reports that over 300,000 residents were not connected to a proper water or sewage network, especially when they were living in informal housing settlements. Um, and so during a water crisis, this exposed them to a very high risk of unsafe water and health related dangers and um, being vulnerable communities. They were also the ones that were least able to afford uh, these health costs that resulted from exposure to unsafe water. Um, and as a result of this, some of the communities resorted to illegally tapping water pipes that ran under their homes and that worsened the overall water supply and water quality crisis that was happening. And amongst these groups, um, women and girls were disproportionately affected. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. So in our work, we often say that women bear a double burden when it comes to uh, climate impacts and especially water scarcity um, in that Many women have a productive role, uh, that is, they contribute to agriculture and farming activities, they rely on meager yields of small plots of farms, of substance, subsistence agriculture, uh, but at the same time they have little or no access to support when it might come to water shortage. Um, and on the other hand, they also have a reproductive or domestic role when it comes to water, which is uh, shouldering the burden of household responsibilities like collection of water, uh, washing, cooking, and cleaning, of wa uh, cleaning with water. Um, and so they are usually disproportionately affected by these crises. Uh, for example, in our uh, case study, we looked at uh, Maharashtra, where there was a drought in the region and uh, male farmers migrated um, out of the rural areas to urban centers due to depleting water resources. And so the women that were left behind were severely affected, um, not only because they were also facing the crisis, but now they uh, had very little support and um, had to take over their husbands or brothers or fathers roles, which added to their work workload. Um, and at the same time, while they um, overall in the country, while women comprise over 42% of the agricultural labor force in India, they own less than 2% of the country's farmland. So that greatly further limits their access to resources, credit, technology, irrigation. Um, and Apart from that, there are other social norms or practices that exacerbate these, um, these vulnerabilities in women and girls. Um, and so beyond such direct relationship to water, um, gender equality is also related to conflict. So there are many studies uh, that came up that show that violence against women is a predictor of how prone a state can be to conflict. Um, and the larger the gender gaps, the more likely a country is to be involved in conflict and to use violence as a first response in conflict settings. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so addressing and applying uh, a gender and social equity lens was uh, quite important um, in all of our solutions. It was a cross-cutting approach and we included these in all sorts of solutions ranging from some of the technical ones that Peter and Charlie mentioned like water pricing um, to some of the more governance and policy oriented ones. Um, so today, uh, the ones on your screen, these are the ones that I will highlight in my presentation going forward. Um, next slide. And to further um, sort of compress these, I've um, grouped them into four different categories. Um, so let's jump right into that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the first one is human right to water, sanitation, and hygiene, WASH. Uh, now the United Nations declared a formal human right to water and sanitation in 2010, but enforcing that right in the context of water-related violence has not been very successful. Um, so our report identifies providing access to safe, reliable, and affordable water for drinking and household use, um, and providing safe access and reliable and affordable access to sanitation services as a key solution in some areas. Um, going back to the example in Basra, uh, we suggest that the government could look to expand service delivery infrastructure of water and sanitation across the country, um, especially for those that have remained disconnected from these services. Um, and this will not only help prevent these illegal tappings and exorbitant decreases in water prices during the crises, but might also help mitigate water quality issues. Next slide. 
Now, Charlie touched upon this a little bit, but we, we also stress upon the importance of solutions that include participatory decision making and management and planning with, uh, with regards to scarce water resources. Um, there are many studies that show the benefits of inclusive stakeholder engagement from all over the world, from um, decentralized units like water user groups to utility levels. Um, and for instance, there are studies that say that when women influence water management, um, their communities get measurably better outcomes, which includes better functioning water systems and equitable distribution of water, especially when uh, water is scarce. Uh, and so similar research also shows that gender inclusive peace processes also produce longer lasting and more robust agreements that are less likely to be broken. However, women's participation and decision making roles is often restricted by their lower status in the society and the discrimination that they face due to social norms and other barriers. Um, and so breaking such country specific structural, social, legal, economic barriers are also essential um, to help make these participatory processes um, possible. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the demand side pressures on scarce water resources, uh, we talk about strategies that can help slow and reverse population growth rates. Um, experience from a wide range of countries shows that fertility rates can drop rapidly when the following um, three strategies are pursued, that is, increasing secondary education rates for both girls and boys, um, increasing the acceptance of uh, reproductive health services and family planning services, and reducing infant and child mortality. Um, however, underlying all of these more technical solutions is uh, the enabling condition uh, to make it a rights-based approach to make sure that uh, women's status in the society is raised. Um, because usually high fertility rates indicate a low status of women in society. So underlying gender equality also needs to improve um, to make these technical solutions possible. Uh, next slide, please. And so the final bucket of solutions that I'll talk about today is um, overall policies that address social um, and gender equality. Uh, now a gender neutral policy can usually be a gender blind policy in that it ignores the different roles and responsibilities, capabilities and needs and priorities of men and women. Um, for example, in our case study um, in, of the dry corridor in Central America, we found that fewer than half of all the agricultural, food security and climate change policies and programs in the countries meaningfully include gender considerations explicitly. Um, there are various schemes that require um, the, the participants do have land ownership and land title, but without land and water rights uh, to everyone equitably, um, many groups miss out on, these, um, on, these, on the benefits of these policies. And so we also specifically say that policies like uh, reforming user rights to water and land to make these rights clearer and more transparent, efficient and equitable, uh, and making water and land use more sustainable is key. And that specifically includes reform of rights that are discriminatory against women. Um, next slide. Uh, so yeah, those were the few solutions that I've talked about in this presentation, but please do read our report. There are plenty more and specific to each of the case studies that, that we mentioned on there. But thank you. Thank you very much, Ayushi. Also thanking you for addressing quite a few of the questions that have come in. So we got a few questions around what's the role of women, um, what can be done about certain gender biases when it comes to water management and so on. So I, I hope uh, quite a few of the questions that we've seen in the Q&A have, have at least partly been answered. Um, what we'd like to do now is to move to one specific example. The report contains quite a few case studies and examples. There are many more around the world, but one that we would like to look at today is uh, Mali. And we have um, Chris Baker with us today. Chris is the program head water resources at Wetlands International. And he'll share with us some thoughts on the specific situation in Mali when it comes to water related conflict, but also solutions to that. Chris, please go ahead. Chris, you're muted. 
Yeah, I think you're still muted. Typical. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you for the introduction, uh, Susanna. Um, indeed, uh, my name is Chris Baker. I work for Wetlands International, uh, based in the Netherlands. You might have expected my colleague uh, Karunda Keita to make this presentation, as was advertised, but unfortunately he was unable to make it, so I've uh, agreed to take this on for him. Um, what we want to do today is, is more or less as uh, Susanna has explained. I, I want to look at water and conflict solutions in Mali by, by zooming into a particular subset of them related to water security and wetlands. And um, I'm going to do that by giving you a, a profile of the inner Niger Delta and the types of conflicts that are being experienced there, and then start to talk a little bit about the types of solutions that we see are necessary. Um, next slide, please. First of all, I just want to make a more general point. Um, this is a, an image of uh, wetlands, so rivers, lakes, marshes, swamps, across the whole of the Sahel, if you were to look with an open eye throughout the whole year. It shows you where water is, regardless of seasonality. And what you see is that wetlands are rather more prevalent across the Sahel than you might expect. There are a lot of water resources there, uh, and they're very important for people and not just in terms of a resource to be used for irrigating or for hydropower, but actually they're eco-agricultural systems that really play an integral part in supporting the livelihoods and welfare of millions of people across the region. Um, if you take into account that 70 to 85% of the population across the region live within 50 kilometers of the main rivers, you start to see the implicit importance of them. In most, most all of these systems, there's a, there's a regime to these systems. There's a flood and there's a dry season. Uh, and this is critically important because eco-agricultural systems need this flood regime to, to function. You get uh, production of rice or grasses or fisheries in line with this flood regime and the livelihoods of many, many millions of rural people are aligned with this regime. So when you lose the regime, then you, you really have a problem. And that's where more wider water insecurity issues really come to the sharp end for a lot of communities in the Sahel. If you start to talk about Mali, um, of course, it's a very complex uh, situation and it's not fair to uh, point to water insecurity as uh, the key driving factor. It's one of many root causes. And I'll try to investigate that root cause in this particular uh, presentation. But um, histories of conflicts between communities go back many, many years. Um, there's always been some sorts of tension at some level uh, in the terms of the use of natural resources, I believe, even though there have been better governance systems in place. Um, of course, there was the civil war in 2012, and there's been a progressive growth of conflict across the country since that, that, since that took place. Um, we're now in a situation where many of the military solutions have not worked. We have ongoing conflicts in many locations across Mali. The government has largely withdrawn from many parts of the country, especially the north and the central area. Um, there's very low trust between people in the military and at the moment even many people no longer dare to go out and plant their crops uh, in large parts of the country. So it's a very serious and difficult situation which of course has culminated in recent weeks with the, the coup and the ongoing dialogue on how to re-establish uh, government. Um, but from, for our part we're going to look now at the water insecurity uh, and its part in this story. Next slide please. I'm going to zoom into the Inner Niger Delta in Mali. Um, this is a, a large scale, if you like, eco agricultural system that has been supporting livelihoods for well, decades, centuries even. It's um, the second largest wetland in Africa. At its fullest flooding extent, it covers an area the size of Belgium. It's currently home to around about uh, 2 million people. And uh, it's, there's some figures there in the slide you can see. It's critically important in terms of the production of of uh, rice, so cereals, fish. It supports uh, about 50% of the nation's livestock, both sedentary and nomadic. Um, and in such, in terms of primary production, but also in terms of the secondary processes that uh, process these uh, products, it's hugely important in the economy of Mali. I think it covers something like 1.6% of the area of Mali at its fullest extent, but it contributes an estimated 8% of GDP. It's a very important system. Now, how this system works is you have uh, rainfall falling up in the Futajalo Highlands in Guinea, which uh, flows downstream uh, in late summer into the autumn into the Inner Niger Delta. The Delta expands, creating uh, ideal conditions for the growing of wild grasses called bubu. Um, these grasslands are vital uh, areas for fisheries, spawning and growth. 
and supply uh, that and there's the flood ebbs. Um, the grasses are exposed. Um, grazers come in with their livestock and graze on uh, bulgur grass. Uh, fishers come in and fish the, take the fish out. And all this period, the, um, the, the rice producers are able to irrigate uh, using the waters of the delta until you reach the dry period, the dry season in uh, late winter, early spring. So it has this, this regime and this is what people are, are adapted to. And in very broad terms, you can say the more water, the more production. Um, the greater the flood, the more, more potential for fisheries and for bulgur production for grazing and rice. But it's not so simple. When you start to lose water, um, there are critical points where that linear relationship breaks down. If I give you the example of bulgur grass, which supports millions of head of cattle in this region, um, when you go below a certain depth, then bulgur doesn't grow anymore. And then you lose the crop. And so you see this relationship between water insecurity and people's livelihoods is not a simple one. And an understanding of how the ecosystem works is critical to understanding why you might create pressure on people and also critical to understanding what solutions you need. Next slide, please. Oh, I think you've um, lost one. Or not. Okay, maybe I've lost one. <laughs> um, okay, no, it's okay. Now, at a, at a macro scale, you can look at the sorts of factors contributing to conflicts within Mali. Um, if you look back historically, there is a, a general um, flow of climate change which has influenced the extent of the delta. I think if you go back to the 1960s, you can see that the flooded area was often as much as 40 to 50,000 kilometers squared. Whereas in recent decades, uh, particularly starting from the mid 1980s, that, that flood area has dropped frequently to around 10 to 15,000 uh, kilometers squared. Um, a lot of that is climate driven, but as you'll see uh, later on in the presentation, it's more and more driven by how water is being allocated for socioeconomic development. Another critical factor is the speed at which population is growing. Um, I've been associated somewhat with the work there for the last 10 to 15 years, and when I started, the population was 1 million. I know now estimates of the population of the Delta are already risen to 2 million. So this is a, another, these two things are combined. Uh, loss of flooded area and growing population growth are combining to create, create increased pressure upon the accessibility and availability of natural resources. Next slide, please. Now, when you start to look at um, how this maps out as conflicts on the ground in Mali, then um, you start to see you're beginning to get a, a crunch upon um, the production of natural resources because the flooding area is decreasing. Um, and therefore, that's concentrating people more and more on less and less available resources. Now that's a problem, but it's a bigger problem because uh, there's a breakdown in natural resource governance as well. Um, traditional relationships between um, grazers, rice growers, fishers, which uh, maybe uh, 50 to 100 years ago were locally managed by uh, local tribes, have broken down. Um, and then in association with the growing lack of resources, you're seeing that um, the traditional ethnic divisions of rice grazing and uh, fish are breaking down and people are diversifying their livelihoods. There's, there's no management of that relationship with how natural resources are used. And that's creating conflicts as the book highlights uh, with the herders, but also between herders and fishermen, herders and uh, agriculturists, agriculturists and agriculturists. Um, there's competition for grazing grounds with people who want to grow rice. These sorts of things are really driving the conflict. I, I have to uh, speed up. And alongside this, you have the wider problems of conflict. There's uh, a lack of trust of uh, youth groups uh, and joining rebel groups. They're, they're frustrated with the lack of development in these regions. You have um, corruption within the government authorities and aggression towards local communities, particularly since the civil war and uh, at national scale of breakdown in governments. Next slide, please. This is becoming going to be further exacerbated in the future. This is very quickly looking at how a future picture of water resources might map out. The map shows you the delta and the river and um, different pieces of infrastructure which are under development. Next slide, please. We've done a lot of work in trying to analyze uh, what these will mean for water flows and flood extent and the social economy of the region. And you start to see uh, a future scenario which is quite dramatic. Uh, significant drops in production of rice, fishery and uh, cattle production. And perhaps even more concerning is what happens in very dry years. Uh, the 1980s was a catastrophic period of droughts in the region and we're moving from having a, a frequency of these of one every 50 years now to one every 12 years. 
uh, and just dry years will go from once every 10 years to once every two or three years. So we have a very serious problem approaching us. Next slide, please. So this is a very complex situation. What, what sorts of solutions can we start to identify? And I've tried to divide them scale-wise into the types of things we're seeing. I won't, won't go through them systematically because we haven't got the time. But at local level, um, it's very important to address these governance and relationship issues. And we found working in places such as the Suru further uh, south in uh, Mali and in parts of the Niger Delta, that building unions and coalitions, re-establishing trust between different users of the natural resources is a key starting point to get trust and cooperation going. And then trying to introduce them to some of the uh, less um, threatening parts of the government extension agencies in the field to re-establish trust with governments. Um, other things are critically important pilot projects to show how you can bring back lost booboo fields and re-establish grazing for grazers. These sorts of things uh, have a very important role to play. When you go to a different scale and you start to talk nationally and regionally, you have to start targeting them more and more about how natural resources, particularly water, is being planned and managed. Environmental flow uh, analyses and tools are very important. These are things we've been piloting with the Mali and Guinean government in recent time. And then I think it's very important to note there's a lot of money going towards the region in terms of trying to support sustainable development, rehabilitate the environment. Um, and we need to de-risk this. A uh, lot goes towards uh, sometimes uh, suboptimally planned or thought out infrastructure for dams and irrigation. But we also need to realign it. Much investment is going to forests, it's going to drylands, but it's not going to these wetland systems and their restoration. So um, we need to think about how we're financing and where it's going. And there I'll stop. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for this case study from Mali. We've got a number, or actually very many, um, interesting questions. You might have seen that we've tried to respond to your questions in the chat, in the Q&A function already, hoping um, that some of your questions can be answered. But uh, my colleague Malina will also share again in the chat with everyone the websites of our respective organizations and the tools so that you can get in touch with us uh, if you have specific questions. We'd love to engage with you further but unfortunately if you look at the time we won't be able to pick up questions now because it would also not be fair to just pick one single question and leave all the others um, ignored. I would just like to very quickly wrap up the event. I'm not going to summarize anything. I'm just going to highlight that we looked at the solutions from the different perspectives but I think the main lessons with regards to the solutions was um, that it matters how they're being implemented, how they're being adapted to the local context, um, how different stakeholders, how different sectors, how different water users, but also women, youth, and other um, stakeholders are being brought into the discussion. And I think what has been a particularly interesting message from your questions and comments in the Q&A function is that many of you think, and I think we here on the panel tend to agree to that, that ultimately it's not absolute water scarcity or climate change that will lead to conflict, but the question is how do we deal with these situations? And the question is how resilient are institutions, our societies to address water-related challenges? This is bad news in so far as that would mean that water-related conflicts could also occur in regions that are not specifically prone to drought, but I think it's much more good news because it's, it means that we can do something. It means that we can work on improving resilience, improving institutions, improving the participation of especially marginalized and, and unequally treated actors and prevent or at least mitigate some of these conflicts. Um, and with that, I am afraid I'll have to close today's meeting. It was really great that all of you participated. Um, we had a significant number of participants. We got many questions, so thanks, thanks a lot for that. Thanks to all the panelists who participated, especially thanks to Kitty taking the time to join us here today with your busy schedule. And then I'd just last but not least like to thank the three co-conveners, so the Pacific Institute, um, the World Resource Institute, and the Water, Peace and Security Partnership, and very, very last but not least, uh, Malina and Emily, who helped us set up the event today, have been helping with answering the questions and made all of that possible. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you, maybe ask all the panelists to switch on their cameras one last time. And um, thanks for joining. We'll say goodbye to you and see you next time. And in the meantime, visit our websites. Thank you, goodbye.